All right, good morning. Open your Bibles to the Revelation of Jesus Christ to chapter 22. If you don't have a Bible, navigate on your phone or your other device. Chapter 22 of the Revelation. Today we finish our 34-week study in this marvelous book. The topic, the last words of the Revelation are appropriately an invitation for whoever to come and be saved. The title of our message, Famous Lasting Words. Let's pray. Father, we want to just experience you in these words. Lord, this is the last few words of the last book of the Bible, and you figure prominently as you should. It is where we're headed. It's the certainty of our future. And so I pray, Lord, that uh, we wouldn't need any other excitement. The, the Bible has its own excitement for us. Guide and direct our talk. May we learn about these words in their original context, but also in the context of our lives. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And those who agreed said, amen. I never realized how many jobs there are for keepers. There are tavern keepers, lighthouse keepers, inn keepers, zoo keepers, house keepers, door keepers, crow keepers, peace keepers, wardrobe keepers, time keepers, key keepers, Animal keepers, lock keepers, flame keepers, record keepers, water keepers, and vine keepers. There are pond keepers, park keepers, and prison keepers. There are bar, uh, bar, keeper, bar keepers, rather, bee keepers, and book keepers. There are grounds keepers, gates keepers, greens keepers, and gold keepers. There are score keepers, shop keepers, stock keepers, supply keepers, station keepers, and store keepers. Hagrid was grounds keeper, game keeper, and keeper of keys for... Hogwarts. Doctor Strange is the stone keeper in the MCU, and horror fans love the crypt keeper. Have I missed any? I did miss at least one that I'm going to introduce you to this morning. Jesus has given us a job as words keepers. We see it in verses 7 and 9. He said, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Then an angel said to John, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Jesus provided a job description for words keepers. Verse 7, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book. Verse 19, do not take away from the prophecies of this book. Verse 18, we're to make sure people hear the prophecies of this book. This book and its words, the revelation of Jesus Christ, need keepers in every generation. We have the watch. I'll organize my comments around two points. Number one, you are appointed to be a words keeper. And number two, you are anointed to be a words keeper. Let's take a look at our appointment in verses six through nine. Keep the words of this prophecy. We immediately hear it as a general appeal to obey the Bible. That isn't quite what is meant. There was no 66 book Bible when John wrote these words. It is the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, its words that we are to keep. Keep can mean obey, but it can also mean guard and maintain. Jesus gives us, the church in every generation, the responsibility to guard and maintain his revelation. And so in verse six, then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Faithful and true as opposed to false prophecies circulated by others. If I see one more History Channel program about Nostradamus, I'm going to go insane with rage. While they try and fit his crazy quatrains into something that maybe might could happen, the Bible sits there 100% accurate in having predicted the past and with the promise of 100% accuracy of the future. God is gracious to include us in his counsels by showing us the future. He reveals the future to strengthen us in the present. Also, it is an act of intimacy between friends to share secrets. And so the Lord lets us in on a secret, on the end of all things as far as this current earth, and it strengthens us to know that we win in the end. Verse 7, behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. 
Jesus thrice says he's coming quickly, verse 7, 12, and 20. He was not talking about his second coming. He will first return in the clouds to resurrect the dead in Christ and transform living believers to take us to heaven prior to the seven-year great tribulation. The second coming is preceded by all of the events in chapters 4 through 18. The great tribulation leading up to the second coming. Jesus' return to take the church to heaven has no preceding event. It could happen any moment, and that's why we call it imminent. An imminent event is certain to occur at some time, but we are uncertain as to what time. It may take place within a short time, but it does not have to to do so to be imminent. People say to me sometimes, you've been talking about the rapture since you got saved in 1979, aren't you discouraged? I said, no, because it's always imminent. It doesn't matter that we're 40 years later, or however long ago that was, it, it still remains an imminent event that could happen at any minute. We become discouraged that the Lord has yet to come for us, but it doesn't alter the fact that he can and will come at any moment. Now, this is the sixth of seven blessings conferred in the Revelation. If you recall the first, it was in chapter 1, and it was in verse 3, and it said, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written, because the time is near. And we talked about then how I am getting a blessing for reading this, and I need all the blessing I can get. And so I get a blessing, and you get a blessing for hearing it. And then I figured that was the end of that for a while. And then while I was studying this week, this, these final blessings, uh, I realized that God really abundantly blessed us in one particular way during these studies in the Revelation. Do you remember how it was? We retired our mortgage during that time, which is an amazing thing for a church to do. So I can get up here, here and just teach Revelation and not beg you for money because we don't need it for the building, it's paid off, right? And so I thought, that, that's the Lord blessing us. Now, you, you might think, oh, that was gonna happen anyway. I don't think so. Uh, you know, it was, in the, and the way it happened, the Lord didn't, you know, one person didn't come forward and say, here's the money there, and there was no campaign to raise money, and there was nothing like that. It's just all of a sudden, one day, it seemed almost, I hate to use the word, but magical that we had the money that we needed. And it was just God blessing us. And so uh, when people say, uh, you know, when people look at this, uh, we have that in our repertoire. God blessed us for studying this book. And so that's why we're going to start again next week. <laughs> Just keep going through it. Well, you know, if you're a band on tour, you play the same songs every stinking night, right? There's always the, at the concert, there's always the, you know, second call and come back, you know, and it's always their famous song or whatever. Why don't we just keep teaching the revelation? I receive this as a fulfillment of the blessing. Verse eight. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, see that you do not do that. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. John knew better, but he found himself worshiping an angel for the second time. The angel corrected him for his own good. I, I pray that we would learn to receive correction in all of the Christian life that is proper. I mean, not all correction is, is proper, but when it is, that we would realize that it's for our own good. When we worship together, it is essential we worship God and not someone or something else. I don't want to go too far afield, but I will give one example. Be careful you are not worshiping worship. The singing in churches, it's trending towards a performance, more like a concert. You're not going to believe this, I hope, uh, but this is true, and I know some. There are churches that hire professional musicians who are not believers in Jesus Christ to be on their worship team because they're looking for a particular sound and all, and they defend that because we're giving God excellence. I say you're giving God some bum who was up till three in the morning at his last gig and is, you know, uh, hung over. Uh, my brother was a musician. <laughs> 
and my brother and dad owned a bar. So, you know, I just, it just, I know what I'm talking about. But you know what I mean? I mean, I would say at that point, and this is me talking, I would say at that point, when you're looking to hire professional, non-believing musicians for your worship team, you have crossed a line into worshiping worship. And so, uh, you know, I'm not criticizing talent or saying smaller is better. You can sing old songs, new songs, acapella, plugged, unplugged, big team, small team, no team. But it needs to be a matter of the heart. It needs to be raised up by God in the local fellowship using the gifts and talents of people in that fellowship to produce the kind of worship God wants for that fellowship. God doesn't want the same worship for every church. We can't look at the mega church that has professional worship and say, oh, that's what God wants for every church. And if only our church had that, we would grow. That's Each church, God wants to be individual and blessed in their own way. And, and one of the great blessings of my career here in Hanford has been the worship teams that we've had and the worship uh, that we've enjoyed. And so uh, you can applaud for them if you like. They would have gotten a blessing, but now it's too late. <laughs> As it turns out, the church needs this exhortation to keep the words of this book. The Revelation is always on any list of the most neglected books in the Bible, certainly in the New Testament. Many of you have come up and told me during this series that you've never heard a message from the Revelation in church. And that's a tragedy because Jesus says to keep the words of this book. You're anointed to be a words keeper. Part of our job description is to partner with God, the Holy Spirit, to spread the revelation. Verse 17, for example, the Spirit and the bride say, come. The Spirit is God, the Holy Spirit, who indwells us. The bride is the church. We are therefore anointed by God, the Holy Spirit, to invite everyone to come to Jesus and be saved. Verse 10, and he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. The revelation was for immediate circulation. We saw that it was taken to the seven churches of Asia, and it remains an active prophecy for the church. I want to emphasize one final time. Uh, some of you have gotten tired of hearing this, but I think it's important. One last time, the revelation is not what scholars call apocalyptic literature. That is a genre, it is a type of literature that uh, is mostly allegorical, metaphorical, symbolic, with no particular meaning assigned to it. And so these guys that don't want to take the revelation literally because of their systematic theology, they've come up with this, this confusing argument. They say the apocalypse, right, that's what it's called, the apocalypse, is apocalyptic literature. And you think, well, that makes sense, but it doesn't. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and it's not apocalyptic because it says of itself four times in this chapter alone, it is a prophecy. Prophecy is way, way different than apocalyptic literature. Uh, it, it, it just, it's true for one thing. And most of this book is in the future. It hasn't happened. It didn't happen in the first century. It doesn't happen behind the scenes in some mythical allegory. It is true and literal. And so futurists like ourselves, we end up being criticized for being escapists, like we just want to get out of here and be of no help to the world. But that's not true. The truth is being words keepers lights a fire in us to see others saved because we believe that Jesus could come at any moment. It's when we seal these prophetic words and look at them some other way that focus becomes manward and inward and earthly rather than Godward and outward and heavenly. And so we need to hang on to the thought that the Lord could come at any moment. Uh, certainly it's more motivating. It's true, but it's also more motivating than saying that this is an allegory uh, just for our personal encouragement. The time period in which the prophecies of this book will take place was at hand may seem to us like a long time has passed since John wrote that. If there were another way, a faster way of getting us to the end, God would have implemented it. As I've said before, we don't have any idea how difficult it is to get the heart of man to submit to God 
and end up being born again and a free will being for eternity. Iron Man said it best, we're all kinds of stubborn. Remember when, when uh, I think it was in uh, Infinity, no, it was Endgame. No, Infinity War. I was watching that the other day. It's one of those movies. So anyway, and, and we, we all, we like to celebrate the stubborn spirit of man in movies. You know, Captain Kirk, I will not give in. And he always wins in the end. You know, that kind of, yeah, humanity. And we say, well, oh Lord, how come you haven't come yet? Because of that, because humanity is stubborn. The heart of man is, is difficult to reach. If the Bible says in the New Testament, God came, Jesus came at the perfect time that was set by God. And so everything's in its perfect timing. And it only seems like a long time to us because we don't understand the depth of the situation. How do you end up with a free will being made in the image of God who will never sin? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a big one. You say, well, why won't we sin? God never sins and will be like God. The testing will be over. And so it's a, it's a big project. It's a huge process. Verse 11, and he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Comes a time in every life when it's too late to receive the forgiveness of your sins. For most, that time is at your death. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this comes judgment. No second chance. The word unjust reminds me that I am a sinner. I'm unable to stand before the just judgment of God. He can, however, justify me based on Jesus taking my place on the cross. He declares believing sinners righteous. I stand before the Lord dressed in filthy garments. Jesus takes my filth upon himself and exchanges it for his holiness by his sacrifice on the cross. Verse 12, and behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Does that sound at all like the second coming? We read about the second coming earlier in this book. Jesus is coming with his saints, not for them, with his saints, and he judges the world. He doesn't reward anybody. Non-believers are sent to Hades to await eternal conscious punishment, and believers are invited to uh, walk into the kingdom and to begin to repopulate the kingdom. There's no rewards. And so he's not talking about the second coming. He's talking about the rapture when he returns for us and we are rewarded. Work is singular here, refers to the sum of your life's work. We, we talk about that, right? We, we describe people saying that something was their life's work and they dedicated themselves to it. Whatever your work is, whether it's a career, whether it's several careers, whether it's whatever, it needs to be your life's work to infuse Jesus into it so that people know you're a Christian and become hungry and thirsty for the Lord. That's your life's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Jesus identified himself using three strong statements that only God can make. And so Jesus is declaring himself God. I'm just going to give you three words to aid you in thinking more deeply on your own about the titles, maybe a little devotional for you. As the Alpha and the Omega, Jesus communicates. As the beginning and the end, he completes. As the first and the last, he creates. Verse 14, blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. This is the seventh and final blessing. You're not blessed only if or because you do his commandments. You do his commandments by his power because he blesses you. This I see as a response more than a responsibility. Yes, we're responsible to obey and to cooperate with the Lord, but we can't keep any commandments without his help, right? That's the whole point or one of the points of the, the Old Testament law. No one could keep it perfectly. We all fall short. The only one who could and did was Jesus. And so, you know, Christianity isn't a matter of keeping God's law perfectly. It's a matter of having the power to walk with God because you've been born again. Some translations have the phrase wash their robes instead of do his commandments. Again, it's not an appeal to do your own spiritual laundry. Jesus said in Ephesians that he was the one doing the washing and the cleansing and he would one day present you without spot or blemish to his father in heaven. 
And so these blessings are showered upon you. They are not earned. They are gracious. The tree of life from the Garden of Eden was transplanted earlier in this chapter in New Jerusalem. Eternity is not a return to the Garden of Eden. I think we know that, but we sometimes get confused. There are songs about it, or even people say, well, we need to get back to Eden. We're not going back to Eden. We're going forward to New Jerusalem. We're not going to be walking around naked all day, eating fruit, conversing with animals. That was a test that we failed. And now we're headed for something wonderful and marvelous. Hey, I'd be okay in the garden, except the naked animal part, but, uh, you know, and the fruit part, but, well, we're going to eat fruit anyway. So, but, you know, the, but it, it, we're not headed back to the garden. Crosby, Stills, and Nash were wrong. And I think it was, was it Crosby? I think it was Crosby was a degenerate alcoholic, right? So my thing about musicians holds. But anyway, outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. No one's going to be lurking outside trying to break into your mansion. They are forever outside of New Jerusalem, having been cast into and confined to the lake of fire. One commentator put it this way, it is the hopelessness of the final state of the wicked, which is here pictured. The states of both the evil and the good are now fixed forever. There is no word here about a second chance hereafter. A words keeper is sensitive to a few perversions. First of all, dogs. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul calls Judaizers dogs. These were men who came in and said that it's okay that you got born again. That's the beginning, but now you need to be circumcised and follow certain laws uh, from Moses. And Paul very directly called them dogs in a, in a non-politically correct sense. He said they are dogs, and so I guess not all dogs go to heaven is what our conclusion is. <laughs> Sorcerers can be translated evil powers. And so this would include all kinds of occult activity and things like that. Sexual immorality is anything and everything sexual outside of God's loving boundaries in biblical marriage. We need to hold the line here, right? Biblical marriage is a covenant of companionship between one biological man, one biological woman in a monogamous heterosexual commitment for as long as either spouse lives. We hold that line. That's what marriage is. It is nothing else. Murderers, woo. Jesus taught that if you're angry or even insult your brother, you're guilty of heart murder. Anger and abuse are serious problems in Christian community. Spousal abuse, child abuse, general anger, anger expressed through manipulation, fear, these kinds of things. Uh, we need to fess up to it and realize that it's not just a matter of personality or, uh, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, if you've got anger problems, you need to repent. It's not anger management that you know. I'd like to, my anger to manage well. No, <laughs> you need to get rid of your anger. It's a sin. Confess it and see the Holy Spirit work in your life. Whoever loves and practices a lie. We see this worked out in the New Testament book of Acts when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. Peter acted as an intermediary while he watched God kill them for lying. And so the church was diligent, and that's what a words keeper has to be. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. We haven't heard churches since chapter 3. In chapters 4 through 18, the church is not on earth while the great tribulation is wrathing on the earth. As the root of David, Jesus preceded David. As the offspring of David, he came through David's line as a descendant. Jesus precedes and follows David because he was God before David and came as God in human flesh after David. The bright and morning star is the herald of the new day. Satan aspired to that title, but it belongs to the Lord. A continuous new day is coming. There's going to be uh, just all, it's going to be daytime, right? All the time in, in eternity. A continuous new day, the bright and morning star. Verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. The Holy Spirit and the bride, the church, are God's agents to invite lost men 
to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior in the age in which we live and in every generation until that age is over. Whoever desires, whosoever desires may come to Jesus and be spiritually satisfied drinking the water of life. Who is it that hears and thirsts and desires? We would say it is all men everywhere. No one can hear or thirst or desire unless God takes the initiative. I agree with that. But of course, he has taken the initiative. That's what the Bible is all about. It's about God saying, you guys ruined this. This was beautiful. This was a test. Didn't you see it? There's 500,000 trees that you could have eaten from. And I said, don't eat from this one tree. It's a test. And you failed. It's like, have you ever taken that test in school where you don't read the directions and you take the test and the directions say, don't take this test, just sign your name and turn it in? Anybody ever done that? Yeah. And you see all the, well, I can't use that word. Uh, mm, you see all the students uh, who don't read the instructions, you know. But uh, anyway, God says, yeah, you ruined everything. And, and so I am taking the initiative right now. I'm promising you that I will come and solve this as a God-man and restore all things to the way they were. So, of course, God has taken the initiative. He acts upon hearts by grace to free the human will so we can, by faith, choose Jesus Christ. God the Holy Spirit prays in this verse. I believe it's his only recorded prayer in the Bible. Since he is in you and he aids you in your prayers, since he says to the Lord, come, then you're going to be a person that wants the Lord to come. Verse 18, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Believers have sincere differences interpreting the book of the Revelation. Those who disagree with us might be wrong, but... Uh, <laughs> They're not necessarily adding to or subtracting from the revelation. You understand sarcasm, don't you? Is that something I, I, I do? I don't know if you do, but I do. I do think that if you make a conscious decision to neglect the revelation, that the Lord might have to consider it a subtraction. Now, I'm not saying anybody's not a believer, they're going to hell, but if the book says, keep these words and share them, and then you say, yeah, I'm not going to do that. That's a problem. It's a big problem in your walk with the Lord. Jesus didn't give us a complete words keeper checklist for determining if we or someone else is adding to or subtracting from the revelation. We must, however, be vigilant regarding this book in particular and the Bible in general. The Bible doesn't need any addition, and it certainly doesn't need any subtraction. It is all that we need for life and godliness. Verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen, even so come Lord Jesus. The big question here is who is surely? I was super proud of that one, but anyway. The Bible never tells us who surely is. But anyway, Jesus proclaims no less than three times that he is coming. Week after week, for almost 700 Sundays, we've heard here in Calvary, ready or not, Jesus is coming. I don't think it is too repetitive any more than Jesus did. So if the Lord can say it in the space of these few verses three times, and certainly more than that in the entire book of, and in the Bible, we're going to keep saying it because it, is, it may not happen soon, but it's always imminent. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Have you ever come out of an event like a movie or a play and given a short assessment of what you just experienced? It happens all the time. Man, that was great. I loved it. That was awful. Can I get a refund? I mean, you have an immediate kind of visceral reaction. Even so, come Lord Jesus is the reaction a words keeper has upon reading this book. To a certain extent, you, would have, you, you should react this way even if these words weren't here. If, the, if it ended at verse 19, we should all just in a harmony say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Verse 21, and we'll be leaving the book with this. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 
Words keepers are gracious. We have received grace and have experienced it, and so we cannot help but want that for others. At age 92, he might be the most famous groundskeeper in the world. George Toma has been the head groundskeeper for all 55 Super Bowl games, dating back to 1967. He was honored by the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2001 as the recipient of the Daniel F. Reeves Pioneer Award. He was inducted into the Major League Baseball Groundskeepers Hall of Fame on January 8, 2012. And that same year, Toma was inducted into the Kansas City Royals Hall of Fame. The average everyday believer in Jesus is the least famous, most important keeper on earth. Your rewards will come later from your rewards keeper, the Lord Jesus Christ. Final words have tremendous weight. They are powerful, they motivate, they comfort, they inspire. The final words in red in our canon of scripture, surely I am coming quickly. We know that for sure, that the Lord is coming. Amen.